Hello everybody, Antonis here. In this video I'll talk about how I created this bust. I don't know the ball. This is a time lapse with my commentary on top of it. How I'll talk about a few important points before you start. And for this particular project I didn't use any base mesh. I started with the ball, just plain and simple. The start was pretty horrible, you'll see it. But then I improved on myself a little bit and you know, got in line and ended up with this. few things to mention about it is that if you're transitioning from ZBrush to 3D code or you're just curious about 3D code toolset and you are a, zebra, a ZBrush user, the first thing you'll probably question me or anybody is what about the subdivision uh, like levels. So the 3D code doesn't have a traditional subdivision system but it's got something that's called a proxy mesh. In the uh, geometry tab, you go into the proxy method and you, you can decide how you want to approach your uh, proxy mesh. So you can uh, just decimate it or reduce it by this amount. And uh, for example, if I want to decimate it by uh, eight times and I go and press this button right here, it will go and turn it down to, down to probably 100k. You can see it's not as fast as going up and down subdivision levels, but it does the job. And you can all, you always have your mesh, uh, your highest and final mesh that you can go and send down to proxy level. Right then, you can move your stuff around, uh, do whatever you want, go back, and it will. It does go back a little bit of funny way sometimes. It, I'm still investigating how it works, uh, so I wouldn't do too much in proxy. Well, I've done a lot, a lot of stuff in proxy method, in proxy object, and then I jump back into voxels uh, up uh, like 5x up in the subdivision ladder, and I've lost some of my detail that I've had on, in the proxy mesh. So I think I need to investigate a little bit more of this pipeline workload the proxy stuff but in still in the, in a nutshell uh, you can go down to the pro proxy level of uh, much smaller mesh move the stuff around and go back to the highest level so it's a pretty interesting philosophy opposite to what the you know zbrush got and it's got it's got its own you know, drawback uh, so it's got its advantages and disadvantages and uh, it's, it's a disadvantage, it's an advantage, you always have your latest match and you always go down to the subdivision that you need. You don't need to rebake your subdivisions or anything, that you probably do a lot uh, in ZBrush. But if you're a really hardcore ZBrush user, then probably it might take you some accommodation and you might lose some of your workflow uh, tools as well. Anyways, so the idea of the whole the whole sculpture was that I haven't seen anybody doing any like a more or less realistic human base, um, human heads inside 3D code, and I think 3D code has a lot of merit. It can do a lot of stuff and do a lot of stuff in here, and uh, should people should use it a bit more for different purposes, not just to. Feels like people do a lot of uh, use 3D code a lot for concepting, but I think there's a lot of merit for you know production case work. And I'm trying to demonstrate it on my channel that you, you can do pretty damn big environments inside 3D code. You can do props and all that at a pretty decent level. All right. So another thing is that by default your camera field of view is a bit too extreme. Uh, this uh, so I got uh, by default I think you, you have it about 50 and that kind of gets your head you know it's just a bit too distorted so I checked check some field of view according to different lens types I think 20 23 is about um, uh, <clears throat> it's um, it's similar to a 100mm lens, so that's pretty good on the full frame camera. Lighting I use 
Okay, I, I press F5, I get the lighting that's uh, real good real time shad shadowing. I've used it for, throughout the whole video. The, uh, the stuff that you don't get with this real time lighting, I don't know how to change the direction of the light. So I'm kind of stuck with it, uh, with the particular lighting direction. Like, uh, if you're just using this kind of matcap sh shading, then you can rotate it all around but then you don't get any shadows, any real shadows and I really want some real shadows, right? and then obviously you can pick uh, all of the lighting presets that we have here pretty good pretty good they do not affect the real-time shadows They're, it's completely different uh, so your panorama is you know, like completely different from the real-time for the reference, I used quite a bit of 3D scan store. I've got quite a few scans from 3D scan store that I used uh, as a reference, and I'll talk more about it during the video itself. Also, I ju I'll just type in stuff like, you know, like uh, how to draw an eye, how to draw a nose, and I'll Google for that. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much all of my notes, and let's go and start it. Okay, so I'll start just with the ball, and uh, there move the move. I use the move brush to just uh, move the stuff around and shape the generic shape of the you know, of the face. So this part I've duplicated it and created uh, another voxel layer. That would be the neck and, and some bit of shoulders. Not really the neck and the shoulders, but neck and the deltoids. So a lot of proportions that I'm trying to define here, well, they came from quite a bit of live drawing, so I've done hundreds of hours of live drawing, and that definitely helps just to be the general understanding of how the face is looking and what's right and what's not, so I think it really that was my main, my biggest uh, helper overall when you create something like that. <clears throat> I do get a bit lost when I have just some kind of blob right like this. I need to define some shapes where you know, I'll put an eye, I'll put a nose. So I'll just push those out, in and out, like I've done you know, in this last few minutes. Just trying to define a skull. and um, You'll see me fixing this stuff quite a bit. So I will be constantly re-evaluating the mesh. I'll be constantly re-evaluating the proportions and redoing and redoing and redoing. Also, I haven't been doing uh, human sculpting for a while. That's why I was actually thinking at one point that I should do one sculpt and then uh, do a new video and do new recordings of a new sculpt, so it'll be faster. But then I think it's kind of good to show the process when you do a lot of mistakes, so it's easier to talk over them. Otherwise, when you do everything a bit better, a bit, a bit more in line, then it becomes... Uh, Harder to point out different things, it's uh, less of an educational video, becomes less of an educational video, because her mistakes really help to show what you shouldn't do. So I'm finding eyebrows, so just thinking about the skull that is inside this mesh.
Right now I'm about two, I think it's about two or three hundred thousand triangles. I will try always to keep a pretty low count. I think it's three thousand and it'll actually go down in the future. Okay, so right now I'm actually using a chisel, chisel brush to try to define some planes of the head. And you can already see that like the face part of the head, the face features are way too big, honestly. And I would I would be fixing that as well. I'm also experimenting with different brushes. Should I use the chisel brush? Should I even try doing anything? And I also converted the, this mesh to surface. In in surface mode, the brush, like pinch brush, uh, tends to behave quite differently. And it becomes a bit more powerful. It's definitely the thing here is that my proportions are not really there yet and I'm already trying to do some kind of detailing. Each, well, ideally in the ideal world you should get the proportions dead right before you go into any kind of detailing here. But you know, I'm not a perfect human being. I don't do everything 100% right all the time. So I did detailed stuff that I didn't really need to. Okay, so I'm trying to draw a ear now, and it's pretty cool. The brush got these live play tools, so they add a geometry as you go. So I'm not really trying to push out the existing polygons, but actually creates new ones. Well, I mean, ZBrush got similar stuff. And I decided to make the face even bigger. That wasn't, uh, <laughs> that wasn't a really good decision. You can see the so it's all pretty stretched out uh, from the eyebrows down. But that's going to be all fixed. Every time I do something, I just try to feel, try to think about it like, how do I feel about it? How do you feel it's not right? If I feel it's not right, I will keep on doing it and doing it and doing it until it is right. And right now it's on a pause. I might be just checking the reference on my separate screen. So again, I'm kind of tweaking small parts here. I would really, uh, looking back at this particular scalp, I should have really done a bit more of, you know, refining of the big shapes. But you see that right now, I'm just seeing that it's definitely way too stretched out. So I'm just crushing the whole thing down. And for example, the ear is, is placed way back towards the back. So changing from the lighting, lighting is the thing that I wanted to mention that in 3D code, I don't know why, and hopefully they'll fix it later. I cannot change the light. When I turn on the real-time shadows, I cannot change the light direction, which is kind of, kind of sucks. So I'm always stuck with the same lighting. So then I have to switch back to the kind of matcap lighting like I have right here using the panorama and that lighting isn't the best even when I try different maps and different panoramas I always want to get more of this particular lighting it's more realistic 
and it gives you a much better understanding of what's going on. Also, if you're talking about the head in general, I wouldn't really normally use a ball to start with. I would always use some kind of a base mesh or some, especially if I were doing it in ZBrush, where, where I would like to start with the pre-existing base mesh with good topology flow, so I wouldn't have to retopologize it that much, not retopologize it at all. And if you think about games, they actually use the same base mesh, uh, so they have the same anime, they can transfer the animations to the different characters, you know. But here, just for the challenge of, of it, I decided to start with the ball and see how it go. Oh, by the way, right here, I'm using the primitive tool to put the, the eye, eyes inside. And I, the, put them, and they're way too big, I would, later on, I would resize them maybe four or five times, just trying to get them right. All that and all that. But well, you can see already it's kind of, you kind of get a generic face right now. Proportions aren't there yet, but you already can see that, you know, it's got some basic stuff done. But cheekbones probably way too big, way too powerful. Flash around the nose is not there yet. Definitely, of course, uh, you know, elephant in the room, the eyelids aren't done at all. Doing that stuff like eyelids, uh, lips, especially uh, especially area, areas around the eyes, it's always a, it's always a pain, to be honest. I'm, I'm really waiting for VR to start kicking in. Where, uh, I don't have a VR rig yet. Uh, I'm just waiting for it to progress a little bit further. But I think in VR, it's going to be much easier to deal with that uh, areas around, uh, these tight areas around eyes. Because it will feel much more natural. And again, talking about the base mesh. Well, 3D Call has got pretty decent base mesh to start with itself. Uh, maybe in the future I'll do a video where I'm kind of curious about uh, doing some anatomical studies and maybe uh, download a skeleton and start to add all the muscles on top inside 3D Code because it should be pretty easy to do inside 3D Code and also you do some little bit of anatomical studying for yourself. I always wanted to do that, I just never had kind of time and focus to do that. But if I think that it's going to be uh, uh, also a video that I could share with people, that might be good enough motivation for me to do proper anatomical thing. All right, so just uh, scale down the eyes, put them in place. I might do scaling down in the future again. Because eyes we aren't looking uh, realistic at all. Uh, right now, eyes are sitting a bit too far front, so I need to put them a bit further down to the back. So I'm pushing the cheekbones back, just trying to make it a bit more natural. So right now, the things like the eyebrow ridge isn't really there, and I'm actually not sure if I made it, I don't think I, in, in the end I made it that great of a job on this particular bust anyway, but it kind of there and kind of served the purpose, so I decided not to go too picky and not to spend another hour doing it, 
Well, I mean, it's a, I'm going a little bit ahead of the time. But uh, that reach, um, oh, you always when you, I always flow a little bit uh, when I do that one. I think I need to throw it a little bit more. All right, I think right now I'll try to spend a bit more time on the ear. Ear is a complex structure. Again, I'm looking at the reference of the ears, uh, all kinds of people and persons, and also how to draw the ear. Uh, also, when you Google for different references, if you just Google for the eyes, like drawing of an eye, they usually show you pretty bad drawings, and those drawings are often bad because they're not like structural drawings, they don't show you the planes and how the light falls on different parts of the eye or ear. While if you Google for structural drawings, and I found it, well, I'm Russian originally, right? So I, sometimes I Google it in Russian, and Russian school of drawing is a different from the best in one in, in terms of it's always extremely structural. Well, in, in America, they have a similar approach. Uh, they have pretty decent schools there as well, and you can find that uh, they're not that structural, but they have pretty good approach where they break down the shape of the ear, and they try to define where the light falls, where it, you know, degrades and gradients out. So sometimes I would go and look for a pla uh, planes of the head is, is a good one, like planes of the head for drawing, um, I don't know, simplified head for artists, stuff like that. Just Google that if you want to find a good reference. Uh, a good on head, uh, G U D O N. A good on head is a head of a uh, uh, of a guy that's uh, simplified and really it's really easy to see. And the, uh, a gener generic planes of the head. So you see, if you Google that, that guy out, you'll find it again. G U D O N. Good on. And that really helps because, and I was drawing the good on head as well. I would have a plaster model of it and I would just stand there in front of it and draw for hours and hours. Definitely gets it in your memory and uh, to the level of intuition where you feel the head and you feel the planes. So the problem is if you only rely on photos, that people's heads are so different that it's a bit tricky to understand what's going on. Like you Google for a year, you'll get like 15 different years. But yeah, probably years are relatively easy in that particular regard. But if you Google for just a face, you'll get so many different faces that it doesn't really help. I did find that 3D scans they help quite a bit because you can always you can use the same mesh for once. And then that mesh is also, you can apply any kind of shader. Oh, well, just one second. I decided to try a hair, but dropped that idea. <laughs> anyway, going back to the 3D scans. When you model, you're modeling this grayscale mode, right? But 3D scan, and the 3D scan is grayscale model, which is just fantastic. It's just so relevant for 3D that you don't have to you know, think about the shading, you don't have to think about the skin, because skin kind of hides a lot of detail, it's a subsurface material, it's a material. it material, hides quite a bit of material, It's uh, and the skin shading, and it breaks the form as well a little bit. So, so having a 3D scan is fantastic. It's not confusing, it's right there, you can always change the lighting, you all, it's like uh, if you're looking for photos of one person, you probably never find one, but in 3D scan, you're gonna find 
you can place it at any particular angle you want and see how it looks and it's fun, just an amazing one of the best references you can find online is definitely a 3d scan and here I'm, right now i'm just doing some work on the bust uh, doing the neck muscles I do tend to forget the names of all the muscles and uh, except for some major parts. Like I remember them sporadically, so I'm kind of I don't actually remember that neck muscle that goes diagonally across. Yeah, I'm a lazy guy. I should just check that out and tell it to you. But anyway, I do every now and then I memorize them. And then I forget about them, you know. I don't, I because you don't really spell them out when you model anything, and you only spell them out if you teach somebody. And because I don't really teach anatomy classes at all, I don't need to remember that. Right, so I'm just adding a bit of muscle to that, to the neck. Right, actually, when I check the name of the uh, neck muscle, one of the major ones that goes to, from a clavicle down to the base of the skull, and it's a, it's a sternocleidomastoid muscle. Not the easiest name to remember, or... Again. And I think I was saying deltoid muscles, uh, that's correct, trapezoid, trapezoid muscles. Because deltoids are the shoulder muscles. See, I'm a really an anatomical expert, and a real anatomical expert. They're not even trapezoid, but trapezius, upper trapezius and down trapezius. Man, I used to remember all that stuff. Again, if you don't do sculpting every day... Well, I met quite a few character artists that don't re remember that stuff. <clears throat> you learn it, then you just forget about it, and it stays, uh, you get the muscle memory. It stays with you forever. Yeah, I'll be torturing the eyes for quite a while. I'll be coming back to them and then going away and back. So you can see that the E itself is pretty bumpy. Trying to fix it by using the steady stroke and inflate clay. And it just you can see that it's pretty it's not that really dense of a mesh. I wouldn't say that I fixed the ear in the end like too much. It's it's good enough. Some stuff I don't fix because I know it 
not, not going to be that noticeable or when uh, or I know that if you apply the sub surface certain stuff going to be going to disappear So the eyes themselves, at the moment, are a little bit too big still. So I will be making them smaller in the in the future. I was just testing the pinch brush, so that's why I destroyed my nose. Yep, adding some flesh to the nose bridge and around it. The lips a little bit to up front. Well, no, actually, they're pretty good. Sometimes it's hard to understand where, where you should finish and you will start to drag them out up a bit further, a bit, a bit front, a bit to the front, a bit to the back, a bit to the front, a bit to the back. Keep on doing the same thing, just trying to see if it's looking right or not. And with the lips, I was kind of suffer, suffering, uh, especially because, again, I cannot change the lighting here, and I wasn't sure if the light on the light on the lips, the lips were all right or or not. Especially because the lighting is quite harsh, and it just goes from the top to the bottom, like straight down, and that doesn't give. And if you cannot change it, it's a bit tricky to understand. If you if the with the proper shape. Okay, I'm trying to fix the eyelids. And of course, looking from the all the all the angle sex is extremely important. So I'm just making the eyes smaller. There's quite a bit of space uh, if you even touch your eyes at the corners which, that I was trying to add just a few seconds ago and I will be uh, I will keep adding it in future. And even just touching your face when you do stuff, and I'm touching myself right now, helps. Having a having a mirror helps. Just if you getting, if you want to be quite serious about this stuff, well, I actually had a mirror. Uh, when I would just look at my face and you see how it feels. I think one of the like uh, one of the, my first attempts at the head I did maybe 12 years ago, and at the time I asked my friend to do photos of me from uh, left, uh, front, and the top. And there was no zebras at the time, I think. Uh, there wasn't. I mean, there was zebras, but it wasn't really that big at all. You no, know, like 2006. I think no, it's actually yeah, 2006, 2005. Uh, zebras wasn't there at all. And uh, the photos weren't actually correct, so the photos didn't line up properly and I was just killing myself doing stuff in 3D Max, doing everything by polymodeling, 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 dragging those faces up and down and I just couldn't get my um, head right. And uh, I did learn uh, quite a bit of stuff about the face topology and I, it was, I was dreaming at nights with the face topology. 
It was, yeah, that intense. But because I didn't have the right reference, I spent, I spent probably a month trying to get my head right and just couldn't. And of course, at the time, I had pretty limited knowledge of 3D anyway. And then for a few years, I didn't touch like organic sculpting at all. Probably like two or three years. And then somebody recommended me um, ZBrush, right? And the thing is that I still did quite a bit of drawing at the time. So I was studying graphic design and had drawing classes. So I had someone is standing over here. I had anatomy. And I started to draw, to sculpt the head and ZBrush, and I was like blown away. It was so much easier. So I would, I just couldn't do it with polygons before, but now with ZBrush, I was able to do it. Well, obviously we're using 3D code here, but you know I'm talking about a long time ago. So definitely I'm um, quite quite happy about how the progress been go going and how it, m m how it's less and less technical today to approach uh, organic sculpting subject and do it. Even when if you're talking about uh, skin shaders and all that, I remember again trying for hours to set up a skin shader inside my and at the time I didn't know the I didn't understand the scale issues. So if you have a scale, like today I always try to do stuff up to the scale, up to the scale. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about this particular head to be, uh, to be honest, because I just used the, uh, I just used the uh, standard ball size. If I were to do it like a commercial job or any kind of serious personal project, I would have checked the scale properly but again talking back about the scale and why it is important it's super important because if you have a head that is way too small then and you apply your subsurface shader the subsurface shader is based on the scale of a real object so if your head is like five centimeters in size the head is going to be super translucent so i was like why is it not working for me so i had to Play around with mental ray shaders, uh, mental ray subsurface shader for hours to, to, end, to an end, still modifying and modifying and modifying, and nobody could really tell me that, oh, well, your scale is off, that's why I don't get proper shading. Well, not also to say that mental ray, I hate mental ray with all my heart, and I think it's so wonderful that in today it's just abolished uh, altogether, and my doesn't come with it, it comes with an old. And you know other stuff uh, like uh, other <clears throat> software packages have caught up quite a bit, like Blender's Good Cycles, which is pretty decent. I haven't done any subsurface sketch one there, but I think it should do the job pretty well. But yeah, so and I was doing some of uh, presentation for this head. I was using uh, Keyshot again. Keyshot gives you quite a decent skin shader straight away. You don't have to trick it uh, or anything. So. Really, really happy with the progress that's been done over the years in this, uh, you know, in rendering. It's getting less and less technical. And it's a funny thing that people who go into the industry, you know, 10, 20 years ago, they are this really technical 3D artists. What happens, they either go into coding and they start to pick up more uh, again technical skills and become technical artists, or they kind of die out because a lot of them don't, didn't have enough training to show uh, enough uh, no, art training to, to keep up with their recent graduates who are really good artists. So that and that technical skills, they were not really that relevant because everything is getting much, much easier. You no longer have to push towards that much. So yeah, and that's 
uh, and uh, well, anyway, that's a pretty common theme today. So people, when they get in some company, they have two paths. They have few paths to go. They can either go uh, become a um, better artist, or they start going more into programming and scripting, and they become a uh, pipeline engineers. So they get into that, and frankly speaking, if you pick up a scripting language. Uh, coding some coding skills it's definitely better for job security there are definitely less artists who can do coding than than artists that can do you know art, art stuff and uh, there are a lot more jobs for people who can code and they're usually higher paid as well and also another way to go about is to become a manager so quite a few people have seen they go and they be a modelers, then they become a producer, become a manager, team team leader, or stuff like that. I just can't, definitely a good thing that they have a bit of knowledge of the of the whole process, but they just go into another area at all, and they was always. Uh, so all this kind of an evolution in the uh, in the company where you get in, you know what you want to do. Well, talking back to about my sculpt, so I've spent quite a bit of time now uh, adding, and I'm trying to add some detailing to the lips, so I'm adding some flesh to the corners of the lip. Quite often I do something, just uh, sculpt a bit, then I zoom out and try to see if I feel if that stuff looks natural or not. And if it doesn't feel natural, I'll start to tweak it and tweak it until I, until I do. So areas around the eyes, they kind of, it looks more or less decent at the moment. And you can see the mesh is in the proxy mode, so I'm just dealing with a pretty low poly mesh, about just about 200,000 uh, triangles. So I decided to spend a bit more effort on the uh, neck, get it right. Again, I'm constantly looking at the reference and how the uh, the proportions where I measure the uh, distance between the eyes and the chin and then it, between the eyes and the ears. Uh, and the way I measure it, well, I essentially I just, honestly, I just put my fingers to the screen and nothing else. And for example, if I want to measure the length of the neck, it's about a distance from the eyes to the chin. And then I um, took the same distance and put it from the chin to the you know, side of the clavicle bones. Okay, so I finally decided to merge the bust and the head. I'm just using the fill brush to fill in that super crisp stuff. So you see me mostly using the pinch brush here on the move 
Okay, I'm using the cutoff. So I turned it to voxels and decided to use the cutoff. So I've used fill brush, pinch brush, a bit of clay. Just really, really simple tools. If uh, you're coming from ZBrush, then you definitely use a lot of masking. Uh, the masking inside 3D code is you can turn it on in surface mode, so right now in voxels, and I will be turning it on a bit later. So let's put it into proxy mode. I did find I'm still trying to investigate the proxy mode, and I think if you send a voxel mesh, to proxy mode and then you send it back you get some weird stuff like I lost some detail from the proxy mode when I jump back to the high-res mode into voxels and it would happen later on what I ended up doing was I actually duplicated the proxy mesh if you duplicate the proxy layer you get the same mesh just uh, without having the uh, highest subdivision level. And yeah, just constantly looking, re-evaluating the mesh, checking what doesn't look right. On the tip of the nose right now, it's not really that great. Needs to be flatter at the top. Again, tweaking the eyes. Adding a bit more of, uh, bone arc right there. Over the eyes. One of the things you can notice is that the nose is kind of fairly bumpy it can be like that but I decided to straighten it out later on because it kind of was losing shape uh, it can be that bumpy but the male I'm uh, the model I'm doing right now is kind of fairly young person so I want to make it a, uh, want to make it a bit more subtle and uh, without less of a, some without having some particular characteristics as having a strong nose feature. So I didn't like the stuff around the ears. So this particular thing happened because I uh, pinched it. So I was always trying to find a way to fix it. I used this smooth brush there. I think I'll come back to it later. Right, so I want to do the like iris, or how you call it, because well, essentially the eyeball is not perfectly round, so I, want, I need to push that stuff out uh, to make it a really uh, natural eyeball.
And if you want to find a really correct eyeball, I'd recommend you just to Google some kind of eyeball 3D model. Uh, there should be quite a few of those uh, available for free. Oh, it definitely will be a tutorial how to do a proper eyeball because you need a proper eyeball to render correctly, you know, with the, all the insides and proper ref uh, refraction. I, I wasn't going to do a proper eye at all, so I just decided, like, okay, I'll just do something that's there in terms of the shape, but I'm not going to do it to be correctly rendered and look like an eye. And in the end, I just I used some kind of rough plastic shader for the eye inside Keisho. It looks like, a, it starts to look like the eye got some cataract, but at the same time, it looks fairly natural. You can see because I smooth and then half sculpt and sculpt, I constantly lose that creasing around the eyelids. Then I have to refix every time. But it's a fairly easy fix about the creasing, so I did it all the way and over. And you can see I just had a, for one second, I turned on the Google and looked at the eyes that I was trying to mimic. When you're inside the proxy mode, we have less. You can just find place the eyes. Okay, so when you're inside the proxy mode, you have less uh, sculpting tools available. But you kind of have all the major that you need, like clay build up, uh, not just clay and the freezing and move. Don't have the live clay tools, so if you want to do it here, you probably have to go back um, up the division and add the topology, add the extra polygons for the ear, and then sculpt it on. And yeah, there I'm just using the standard uh, 3D color render, which it's all right. So I wanted to add some definition to the lips. Well, to be honest, right now it's already fairly finished model in terms of having this uh, slightly smooth look, but it's okay. But I decided that, okay, I just wanted to spend a bit more time on the lips. Again, just uh, referring to the base, uh, to the Google, checking how the stuff looks when I draw it, checking some 3D scans. <laughs> just apply the different material just to see how it looks. It's a subsurface material that you kind of need to tweak to get it right.
I think it had an issue. Oh, okay, oh, okay. I had I had Kish turned on for one second. Where drop it in, render it uh, using the standard materials inside, and then I found a few things that I wanted to fix, like the cheekbone. I thought it was protruding a bit too far, and the nose wasn't uh, the tip of the nose didn't look right for me. And also I fixed. Uh, I think I made the nose a little bit straighter. I did some flesh to the areas from the nose. Yeah, I'm just trying to fix the nose, the tip of the nose. The tip of the nose looked like it was pointy, it just looked wrong, like it had some kind of strange rhinoplastic, rhinoplastic operation. So it break the nose. Looking from different angles, from the bottom, from the top, is is absolutely paramount to get it right. Okay, I started to use the freeze, uh, freeze tool. So got tired that uh, I couldn't use the move tool without picking up the bottom edges. So I decided to use the freeze tool. So I also, you can use either a brush for the freeze or you can use the, you know, the, like shape selection tools. When you do a shape selection tool, the thing that it kind of does, which is annoying, uh, you paint the shape selection, shape selection, but then it kind of disappears. It's still there, but it doesn't show it on the mesh. So you have to use a brush, a freeze brush tool to activate it. The paint on top. It might sound complicated, but if we do it once, you'll see what I mean. Just do the shape. Alright, so I'm doing this. You see, you can see, you see it didn't look right, so I had to switch to regular brush and paint a little bit on top. And that fixed it immediately. Right, so the freezing definitely helps when you know, working on the different parts of the mesh. I think at one point, I'll probably here, I started to inflate my lips too much. You can see it right, right now, right? So they look like dark lips again. <laughs> like, you, you, like you've injected too much <laughs> collagen inside your lips, and now they're bloating out. <laughs> and I was like, why is it looking like that? Because I had them perfectly right before. Not perfectly right, but they were pretty good, were way better before. And now uh, they don't look right. So I feel like they don't look right. I'm just thinking, oh, what should I do? And uh, I was seeking for a solution for a little while, but really I, ha I had to flatten out the bottom lip. You know, it, it'll help us happen later. Yeah. Flatten out the bottom lip. And put it a little bit, attack it a bit inside. Yes, yeah, it's, it's still. Lips are still quite inflated, quite a bit funny. It's, it's kind of funny point if you want to do it. And, and, Somebody who's got um, plastic surgery on the lips that it wasn't, wasn't good. It wasn't good. That's that's how it's gonna look like. I'm just tweaking the lips, just trying to figure out what the problem is. So I decided that I need to tuck the lips whole, uh, a bit inside the face, which uh, wasn't good. It wasn't a bad decision, but it didn't really help with the look of the lips. So it really was all about the bottom lip. Inflated. Also, they kind of started to look a little bit like female lips.
No, it was, it was really giving me a little bit of a headache. I'm like, oh, why is it not looking right? Because I actually had them pretty good, had them done pretty good before. And it's only because I when I started to add a little bit more of clay on top, it started to go and look strange. I think this is the moment when I started to fix them. Just to... So I freeze that part, inverted the whole selection, and then I just smoothed out the whole lips, the whole lip uh, segment. Uh, what's he not done? I think that if, like, when you look at the anime and some characters have this really juicy lips, then where they show them usually pretty bad guys, evil guys, they have really well defined lips that are super juicy. I don't know why they associated with being a bad guy, but you know, looks pretty evil. Overall, match got some a little bit of bumpiness to it. It's uh, a lot due to the triangulated low poly count. I don't generally mind having minor bumps here and there uh, because you know, my, uh, obviously your face got a little bumpiness to itself. So I'd rather have a little bit of, a little bit of bumpiness and still deal with it on a low resolution scale rather than having it's perfectly smooth but on higher resolution all right this is where i pretty much fixed the mesh by fixed the lips by uh, making them flatter and defining the low low putting them a little bit inside taking them inside made it a much more realistic look. So they stopped looking like a blown out of face sleeps. And I decided to do a little bit more work on the eye corners of the eyes. So you'll see me jumping here up, up and down, like I uh, zoom out, see that, oh, maybe I should do something on on the eyes, then I go back and do something on the lips, and go back and do something on the nose. I lost some definition on the ears. I don't know why, but it happened. But maybe because of tweaking and smoothing, I might have done it by accident. And then I fixed it. Tried doing some pinching on the lips, but it didn't just look right. 
and I I abolished the idea of pension. Right, so I'm doing that muscle again that I already forgotten how it's called. Okay, so this is the part where I'm going to add some just definition to the neck, make it look a little bit more natural. Right, just switched on this wireframe view, and you could have seen that it's really low, low resolution mesh, honestly, like 200,000 is kind of nothing. But it gives you good enough uh, resolution to do almost all of your sculpting there, so you really never need to go up to 2 million unless you need some tiny details like pores or tiny wrinkles. And if you're new to sculpting, I would just recommend never to go up. To that level it's just uh, you can spend a lot of time just trying to detail and thinking that if you add a little bit of uh, resolution to your eyelids then the whole head would look better but it doesn't if you you have to do the whole head right you have to get a um, major understand shape major um, like understanding of the shapes in place before you really go and start doing anything Smaller as I don't know, like a leap, leap wrinkles, wrinkles on eyes. I think this was the moment when I went uh, when I was uh, went from the proxy mode to back to the level one, and it started to look quite different from what I had in proxy mode. Oh yeah, this okay. Right now I'll just make a break. Right now I decided to see what can I do with the haircut if I want a haircut at all or not. You can use a box layer for that uh, inside voxels. Oh, actually inside surface mode as well and then just def define your hair and that will be your base mesh for the haircut but going back to proxy mode when i was going from proxy mode to level one i lost quite a bit of definition and the whole mesh looked different especially our area around the eyelids and you can see i had to go back to autosave and duplicate the proxy model separately and pretty much ignore that original mesh that I had at all. Um, something that I need to troubleshoot, I don't know, I don't understand all the issues that you get with the proxy mode subdivisions. But you do get some. And here I'm almost at the end of the video, so I'm just tweaking, doing some minor stuff, cleaning up the ears, defining the shape a little bit better using the pinch tool.
Yeah, just minor tweaks here and there. In the future, I'll probably make some videos, so I'll definitely use the base mesh, maybe some sculpts, faster sculpts, speed sculpts for a mesh with a character with, um, with some character, you know, with some emotions on them. Less generic. And I double uh, increase the subdivision um, count here, uh, like subdividing the mesh to up to 1 million polygons, 1 million triangles, and just uh, fixing some bumps, uh, maybe that I found me too much. Yeah, look at the jawline and uh, how it looks. And let's show the key shot render. All right, I did a key shot test render, and I think uh, that was my main reference for how to per uh, perceive the mesh. And I thought that, uh, oh yeah, I didn't have, <clears throat> I needed some extra pinching in the corner of the lips. I think that was really my final feedback on myself. Just didn't look natural. Right, so we are almost almost at the end. So I'm just doing some final final trick in, in this corner uh, using this pinching uh, brush. <clears throat> and in the end, I'll just turn on. I'll put it inside Kisha and turn it for about 40 seconds to see how the render is going. Just let's just wait for it. Wait for it. Right, yeah, that goes. So thank you guys for watching, and I hope you got something useful from this uh, tutorial. See you next time.